On the night of March 24, 2023, the lower Mississippi River Valley region was under the gun for a potential nocturnal severe weather outbreak. The Storm Prediction Center had outlined a moderate risk for severe storms, citing the potential for strong, long-tracked tornadoes. At 8 p.m. local time, a significant supercell aided by a strengthening low-level jet with unimpeded inflow planted a significant tornado. For over an hour, this tornado would go on to carve a 60-mile path through Mississippi farm country, impacting the towns of Silver City and, most notably, Rolling Fork. My name is Ethan Moriarty. I'm a mechanical engineer by training with a fascination in tornado damage forensics. This is a damage analysis of the Rolling Fork EF4. Thank you everyone for tuning in to this installment of the Damage Analysis series, and right off the bat I want to start with a quick message. The previous two Damage Analysis videos that I have done were with events that were pretty far removed from the events themselves, uh, those being the Valonia and Parkersburg tornadoes, respectively, and with the case of taking a look at the Rolling Fork tornado today, at, at the date of recording this video, Emotions are still extremely raw from this event. It was a high impact tornado. So with that said, I just want to extend my deepest sympathies to those that may have been personally affected by this tornado. Uh, the towns of Rolling Fork, Silver City, and many of the surrounding agricultural farms that were in this region of Mississippi were heavily impacted by this tornado. Um, if you didn't lose everything you owned, you potentially lost people you loved, or something in between that and significant damage to your property, which is um, life-altering by any stretch of the imagination. So, with that said, due to the fact that this tornado is relatively recent in our minds at the time of recording in this video, my heart goes out to all those. With that said, we're going to go over the statistics of the tornado, and I'd like to note that because I am filming this not far removed from the event, a lot of the information is probably preliminary. So if you're watching this video maybe a year or two down the line, the information that I'm presenting now may be different, so I just want to preface that now. This tornado was on the ground for 59.4 miles and was on the ground for an hour and 11 minutes. So doing the rough math in your head this was a fast moving violent tornado it peaked out at a width of three quarters of a mile so it's a nocturnal wedge tornado given the fact that it touched down in early spring at 8 p.m there's no sunlight available at that hour so this is a worst case scenario when it comes to a violent tornado the current rating for this tornado is an EF4 at 170 miles per hour, and it goes without saying at this point, but when it comes to a lot of these tornadoes in the southeast, their rating is sometimes controversial, and I want to kind of clear the air. I've talked about this topic numerous times. If you're familiar with some of my other videos on the channel, you know that the Enhanced Fujita scale is great in what it does. It allows survey teams uh, from the National Weather Service to easily categorize damage and be able to put together a comprehensive survey in a timely fashion. And it's really great at doing that, um, but you know, there's our nuances and some areas left for interpretation, so that's something to always keep in mind with the Enhanced Vegeta Scale. I know a lot of the times we talk about, oh, taking velocity measurements from radar and stuff like that. That's not something that we have in the case of every tornado. Damage is something that's consistent across all tornadoes, so that's the best way to categorize tornadoes at this period of time, so I just wanted to mention that uh, in the context of the, the rating of the tornado as it stands right now. At the time of recording of this video, there have been 16 confirmed fatalities and an unconfirmed number of injuries. I've seen uh, anywhere from 15 to several dozen reported injuries, and there's probably uh, a mix of different severity when it comes to injuries and that's something that I think a lot of time gets lost on people. I mean we tend to fixate on the fatalities number in a tornado, 
but something that I really, really, really want to emphasize here and something that we have seen in tornadoes in the past that I don't think that gets reported on enough is the fact that many of these injuries are life altering injuries. I'm talking about spinal cord injuries, amputations, head injuries, things along those lines aren't something you're just going to cure in an overnight stay in a hospital. Yes, there are injuries that are like that, but there are many of these injuries in these tornado events that are extreme trauma type events that are life altering. So I want to make sure that when we're talking about the human impacts of tornadoes, we're not strictly looking at the fatalities as like the big heavy number, which obviously it is, but many times too, injuries are very debilitating for those that suffer them. So keep that in mind whenever we talk about fatality and injury figures. With all of this out of the way, we're going to dive into the first of the two big areas that I want to focus on with this video. And the first thing that we're going to look at is the Rolling Fork Water Tower. So here I have the National Weather Service uh, survey loaded up into Google Earth here. First off, I really want to extend a big kudos to the National Weather Service office in Jackson, Mississippi. They have a really tough job when it comes to surveying these tornadoes in a rather difficult environment. Uh, Dixie Alley is a tough place uh, in terms of being able to access locations. Uh, you know, you have very rural areas, sometimes a lot of terrain, trees, stuff like that. So doing these surveys is a very extensive effort and the fact that they're able to do it in a very thorough and short period of time is something that is very, very impressive. And I just want to really extend my gratitude towards the people at the National Weather Service office in Jackson, Mississippi for conducting such a thorough survey in a short period of time on this tornado. So if we're going to zoom in here to Rolling Fork, which as we can see, just backing out really quick again, is at the very beginning of the tornado path in the grand scheme of things. So with, you know, my mouse cursor here, this is Rolling Fork. This tornado continued for another 50 miles past Rolling Fork. And I think that's something that we need to appreciate here in terms of uh, the severity of this tornado. Uh, I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that, you know, it's coming down to something that I've noticed with some of these more violent tornadoes is that the significant impacts happen at the early stage of the tornado. Uh, you know, you look at cases like Parkersburg, for example, where Parkersburg was in, I would say, the front 25% of the damage path. And we're seeing a similar situation here in Rolling Fork. And this is not to take away from the National Weather Service. They do an incredible job in terms of tornado warning lead times. But, you know, when you're issuing a tornado emergency, for example, which this tornado had uh, when it was coming into Rolling Fork, that does not give you a lot of time to really assess the gravity of the situation, especially when you're disoriented, when this is happening at night. There's so many factors that people are trying to take. There's almost sensory overload. So I imagine that had to play into the factor in terms of why this was such a high impact event, alongside the fact that many of the homes in the southeastern United States aren't the best for surviving a tornado of the caliper of Rolling Fork. So with that tangent out of the way, we're going to dive right into the water tower. So this is the official National Weather Service image of the water tower. There have been other great images that I've taken uh, information from online, particularly Simon Brewer's photos. Uh, Simon Brewer, of course, legendary storm chaser. He did a really good job documenting uh, the damage around the water tower, which I used a lot of his information from the photos specifically in order to kind of get an idea of geometries and stuff like that in order to process the calculations that I did here for this video. So with that said, we're going to build a very approximate model. And like I said, this is based off of approximations on photos. I tried taking lengths and stuff like that based on surrounding objects in order to try to get the best idea of the geometry of this water tower. But the first thing to mention when it comes to this water tower is the type of water tower it is. And this is a spheroid water tower. So it is a water tower that has a centrally located 
axis, if you will, like one big pole up the middle and then a big bulbous water tank up elevated. Uh, so, you know, it's not like the water tower that we saw in Mayfield, Kentucky, for example, which was kind of the, you know, it's one with multiple legs. So this is a centrally loaded water tower. I got a lot of comments in terms of what water capacity might have to do with that, and I'll get into that in a second. But the important thing to note is that the weight of the tower is centrally located, which is pretty important when we're considering the wind load on the structure. I estimated a height of around 170 feet. I think it's a little bit of an overestimation, but we're going to roll with that for the purpose of this analysis. The, the actual numbers don't mean as much, I think. I think it's more of the the process here to kind of understand the forces at play here. So main thing here is that, like I said, lots of approximations take a lot of what I'm saying with a grain of salt in terms of the physical numbers themselves. But this is just kind of going over the process in terms of how we were able to get to an answer in the first place. Starting from the bottom to the top, I said that we had a base of around 20 feet and then it tapered to the central column there to a diameter of 10 feet and then eventually flared out to a spherical diameter of 35 feet. The main thing to take away from the image itself is that the tower appeared to fail at the conical base, which is not surprising if you watched my last video regarding the Parkersburg event. We talked a lot about stress concentrations in that video. And one of the main things where stress concentrations like to build up is at discontinuities. So we have that change in diameter from that conical base to the cylindrical portion of the water tower. So that is the perfect area for this tower to fail. Obviously we see that the bolts and the foundation were pulled out of the ground. Clearly this didn't have probably the strongest foundation, but I think the anchoring failed after the water tower had buckled. So once it started to fall over, then it pulled the rest of the foundation out of the ground as it was falling basically. So we're assuming the top of that conical base as the main area of failure. So we really need to take into consideration the cylindrical portion and the spherical portion of the water tower. And so we'll be getting coefficients of drag for that for the force of drag equations that we'll be using in order to approximate the wind speeds. One last thing in terms of geometry, I said that this was constructed out of half inch steel. So half inch thick steel. That doesn't sound like a lot for such a big structure, but steel is a very strong material. We're going to be assuming it's a low carbon steel, so it's going to have a yield stress. So the failure that it starts to deform at is going to be at 30,000 PSI. So that's an important number that we'll use for this calculation. And then we have to take into account, obviously, the shape of the failure area, which is going to be that hollow circle shape. So if we're taking a cross section through that cylinder, that's the shape we're going to have. And that's going to be important later on. So if we're looking at our cross section, we're just going to take two little stress elements and kind of analyze what's going on here. So if we have wind loading coming from one side, that means we have a huge bending moment that's going across our cross section. And that's gonna be the main influence in terms of the stresses at play in the failure region of the water tower. If we look on the one that's on the wind loaded side, that stress element is going to be in tension. The other side of that is going to be in compression. So I think the tension side is gonna be the side to look at. That's gonna be where the failure is gonna take place in the material where it's gonna break and uh, if we look at the image here, it almost looks like that's the case on the backside of that water tower. If we kind of look over in here, we kind of see that there's some sort of um, failure in the material where it almost looks like there was some fracturing that took place. So that's kind of something to keep in mind that we're kind of on the right track here. One last thing that we need to take into account is the weight of the structure. So there's the amount of water that's in it and then the weight of the structure itself. So we are able to get an approximation in terms of the weight of the structure. And then ultimately for the water capacity, I looked at uh, sizes of water towers and then found the capacity that best correlated with a 35 foot diameter water tower, which actually correlated quite nicely to 125,000 gallons. And then what ultimately, what I approximated for the water capacity in the tower, which I'll get to how much that influences in a second, as I said, it's around 25% capacity. And the reason why I said 25% is because of the fact that it happened late at night. Most of the water in the water tower is being used throughout the day. So I figured that the, the tank was depleted at the time of impact and it was in the process of being filled back up uh, in that late evening hour. 
The reason as to why the water is not super important in terms of the failure of the water tower is because the weight of the water is acting along the neutral axis of the water tower. So it's not influencing what's happening with the bending moment. If the water was you know offset from where it was supported then there's going to be a much bigger moment due to that gravitational force kind of pulling the structure over in a sense i think it played a factor once the tower had already failed and started to fall over obviously you're going to have much more of a lever to pull down the structure with whereas in the initial condition of just it being wind loaded the slight shift of it before failing is not going to be enough to weigh heavily if anything it's helping the tension side of the equation that's pulling the structure apart. So there's a little bit of compressive force counteracting the tensile force from the wind loading moment. So with all that said, we have to find the failure criteria for the bending moment. So basically the failure criteria is gonna come down to a couple different parameters. We have the bending moment itself, the distance from the neutral axis, and then also the area moment of inertia. The moment is what we're going to get from the wind loading forces alongside the distances to the center of the shape for each. So the center of the sphere versus the center of the cylinder for how we're approximating these. From the distance from the neutral axis, this is basically the distance from the center of the water tower to the outermost material in that cylindrical section where the water tower failed. So we estimated a diameter of 10 feet so the distance from that neutral axis to that outermost point is going to be five feet. With the area moment of inertia, this is basically taking into account the shape of the object and how this is dissipating the stress in very layman's terms. So different shapes have different ways of dissipating the stress. And fortunately, because we're dealing with a hollow cylindrical section, it, the equation for actually solving for it is actually pretty simple. For our failure stress criteria, it's actually pretty simple. We get the compressive stress that's happening from the weight of the tower plus the water and divide that over the area in order to get the stress that's being caused by that compressive load. And then we're going to basically add that since it's counteracting the tensile stress that's being loaded into the material. So we ultimately get a failure criteria of 32,040 PSI. Finally, to solve for our moment, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. We're going to take the drag equations that we use a lot in these damage analysis videos in order to approximate wind speeds. And this is where we're going to actually be able to get that velocity value. Because we broke the water tower up into two different shapes, we're able to get the spherical part and then the cylindrical part, and then basically get the center distances in order to get the distance away that gives you that lever advantage. So once again, a moment is basically a force times a distance. So the further out on an object you get with a force, the more of a moment you're going to have. The spherical section at the top is going to have much more of a moment than the cylindrical section in the middle. With all of these inputs, we are then able to put it into our bending moment stress equation and then do a little bit of algebra in order to solve for velocity. Once we do the algebra to solve for V, we find that it comes out to 336 feet per second or 229 miles per hour. Now, before you point out that this is EF5 level winds, there are a number of considerations to take into account. The first of which is that this analysis assumes that this is a one solid body material basically so that this thing was made out of one giant piece of metal which we know is not the case it's you know fashioned together by a bunch of different pieces so there's likely a bunch of other failure points that we're not considering another thing we're not accounting for is debris impacts there was indication noted in the survey that there might have been debris that had impacted the tower causing it to fail prematurely another thing to take into account is corrosion Given the photos that I've seen, there were instances that I saw in a lot of these pictures that show that the water tower had areas of significant corrosion, which of course is going to significantly weaken the water tower. Another thing to note is fatigue stress. So this is uh, a stress that basically degrades the material's strength over time. What happens when you start loading and unloading materials, say for a case of a water tower, you know, you're getting wind loads every other day, you're getting the constant forces of filling the tank up, draining it, filling the tank up, draining it. So you're constantly loading, unloading, loading, unloading the material. 
And over time, as you're doing this cycle after cycle after cycle, you're going to weaken the material over extended periods of time. So that's another thing to consider that we're not taking into account in this analysis here. Finally, of course, there's the poor anchoring. The only way that this analysis works, that the way we did it, is if we're taking to account that the conical base is not shifting at all, that it's like permanently anchored to the ground when it fails. There's likely some sort of combination of a buckling failure of that section that we analyzed, plus the anchoring giving away. So, you know, as the thing maybe started to tip over, it buckled and then, you know, it was maybe a combination of the two. So there's all of these different factors that a hand analysis alone is not going to be able to solve. So that's something I really want to point out and why that this DI was an EF4 versus an EF5. With the water tower out of the way, I want to get to the second big thing that I wanted to talk about with the rolling fork tornado, and that has something to do with something that I had already discussed in another video. Last week, not long after the rolling fork event, Max Olson hit me up and said, hey, I want you to take a look at this video. Stop the car. If you haven't seen the footage by now, it's pretty spectacular, but I want to preface that nothing has been 100% confirmed, but based on video evidence and a lot of the context surrounding the video in terms of his location and the surrounding area, it seems as though that Max caught footage, and other chasers as well I might add, footage of what appeared to be a vehicle being suspended and caught in the circulation of the tornado. While we can't say anything with 100% certainty, we can say that it is very plausible given the contextual damage that we've seen thus far in this tornado. So we're going to analyze it as such that we're going to assume that we did see a vehicle and we're going to figure out what it takes in order to keep a vehicle suspended in the air. Quickly though, I wanted to point out something here. So I just wanted to open up this EF4 damage indicator real quick and we note that there is what appears to be a van, you know, on top of a debris pile. It looks like it wasn't there originally, so, you know, it goes to show that a tornado of the Rolling Four caliber is more than capable of keeping a vehicle suspended. To set this problem up, this is a little bit different than something that I've done in any of these damage analysis videos thus far. A lot of what we've looked at is the static objects so things that are not moving so for something that's moving we're taking a dive into dynamics and that side of my mechanical engineering background so this is a little bit different from the kind of more stationary things that we've looked at in the past first thing i want to do is establish what kind of vehicle we're going to be analyzing i decided to go with a ford f-150 and the reason why is because a it's the most common vehicle in america and two this is farm country mississippi where trucks are extremely prevalent so it's extremely reasonable to say that an american pickup truck is probably a good candidate for something lofted in a tornado in this region of mississippi using photogrammetry we were able to estimate the tornado's diameter at 1200 feet which means we have a radius of 600 feet. And then in the video, it appears that the object orbited around at least full one revolution. So we were able to take the time that it took to do that complete revolution, plus the circumference of the tornado in order to approximate a tangential velocity. So basically the speed of it moving around the tornado. And it came out to around 104 miles per hour. This tangential velocity will become important in a second. For this, we need to set up a free body diagram. So here is an image of our truck and we gotta label the external forces that are acting on the vehicle. Firstly, we have the force of gravity, which is something that we always have to account for whenever we're dealing with anything here on earth. There's always gonna be a force that is pulling the mass down with the acceleration due to gravity. Secondly, of course, is the force due to the wind. And I drew it the way I did because of two reasons. One, we have an upward component due to the updraft, and the second component is due to wind funneling into the tornado. 
and if you think about it it makes a lot of sense you know you have a tornado which is basically an area of extremely low pressure which is being fueled by a very intense updraft so you have you know air that's constantly trying to fill in this region of low pressure so it's all coming inward and then also the updraft component where you get that upward motion as well so i drew the wind vector from the 45 degree angle from vertical or horizontal so what we're going to end up doing is breaking that wind component into a vertical direction and then a horizontal direction for simplicity's sake and that's why we have to establish a coordinate system as well now that we've established our free body diagram, we have to have the internal response diagram. So whenever you have an object that's spinning around another object, there is a centripetal force from the object that's pointing towards the center of rotation. You know, when you're driving in a car and you feel being pulled out, that's actually not the centripetal force. It's actually something different. It's the you feeling the tangential velocity, the momentum of moving forward versus the vehicle going in. But when you're pointing, when you're driving a car into a turn, for example, there's a force pointing towards the center of that turn. So this we can calculate using the mass of the vehicle, it's tangential velocity squared and the radius. So these things go together to give us this centripetal force. So that's why that tangential velocity was so important to find. Using that centripetal force and the wind force in the x direction, we're able to set those equal to each other in order to find the velocity force from that drag equation. So we have the drag that's coming across the side of the vehicle. So we're using a coefficient of drag of the side of the vehicle. And then basically because we're saying we're at a steady state, we're able to set the two equal. And what I mean by steady state is that if we're assuming everything is in this steady state, the vehicle is staying in the same spot relative to the tornado. So it's kind of, you know, moving at the same altitude. It's not going out any further or in. It's kind of staying in this one spot, one path around the tornado, if you will. Plugging in all of our inputs and solving for V, we end up getting a horizontal or X component wind factor of 149 miles per hour. We're going to do the same thing for the y direction, except that we do the y component of the wind equation and then compare that to the force due to gravity. We're going to set those equal to each other and then ultimately solve for the wind in the y direction. Because we're using a coefficient of drag in the vertical direction, so we're taking a cross section through the bottom of the truck basically, that's kind of that platform area that we're looking at in terms of what's being uh, interacted with with the wind around it there's a lot more drag taking place so it doesn't take as much of a wind velocity in order to keep the vehicle suspended in that vertical direction so with that said the forces end up working out to the wind velocity in the vertical direction being 90 miles per hour so now that we have the x component and the y component in order to get the total result, we're going to do a little bit of Pythagorean theorem, which you might remember from your geometry class in high school, where we do a squared plus b squared equals c squared. c squared in our case is going to be the final total velocity, and a and b are going to be each our x and y velocities. Plugging those into the equation, we get a final estimate for the velocity needed to keep a vehicle suspended in the tornado in this case an f-150 of 174 miles per hour given the rating of this tornado at 170 miles per hour as a final result at the time of recording of this video might i add this makes a lot of sense you know you have a, a steady state from the optics of the video it definitely seems like it makes one full revolution before it gets to a point where it's unsteady and falls out so it doesn't take, you know, an upper level EF5 tornado to keep a truck like an F-150 suspended for a long period of time. An EF4 is more than capable of keeping a vehicle like an F-150 suspended. With all the math and stuff out of the way, I want to thank you very much for tuning in and listening to this damage analysis video. Uh, it means a lot to me that people care about this side of meteorology, something that is a very niche subject and I got a lot of positive feedback and a lot of support on the uh, 
other two damage analyses that I've done thus far. And there's going to be more in the future. You guys have left some very great suggestions and I'm going to be tackling them in the future. But I wanted to kind of dive into the Rolling Fork event while it's still fresh in our minds in order to give some more context in terms of the power that this tornado had. The key safety lessons that I think that we need to get out of this event is once again that as we talk about with Southeast tornadoes, mobile homes and stuff like that are not the place to be. This is going to be a video topic that I'm going to be diving into in the near future. So I would be around for that uh, because EF2s uh, can completely wipe out a mobile home and we're going to explore that a little bit down the road. So there are a number of instances that I've seen in some of the damage indicators in Rolling Fork of, you know, manufactured type homes, mobile type homes that just did not stand a chance against an EF4 tornado. The other big thing that I want to point out is cars are not a suitable point for shelter by any means, especially in these large tornadoes. Cars are the last place you want to be in alongside mobile homes. You, we've seen some of the images come out of Rolling Fork. Uh, there's a lot of people that covered the Rolling Fork event, so there's a lot of damage photos out there now. And we've seen some cars that there is zero chance that you would have survived if you were in that vehicle at the time of the tornado. So please, on these high event days where there is a risk for strong violent tornadoes or even damaging straight line winds in the case of mobile homes those can easily be destroyed by straight line winds never mind tornadoes so i think it's really important to stay weather aware and i know this is really tough to say because not everybody's going to have immediate access to shelters but it's really important to know where the best place is to shelter in your community in the event that there is, you know, a tornado watch or something like that, you want to be mindful and prepared to act in the event that there is a tornado warning and be able to get there in a very short amount of time, given the circumstances of a tornado bearing down on your town. Thank you again for watching this video. I really hope you learned something or maybe got a safety tip out of this. So that's kind of my main goal with, with these videos is to not only educate, but also to promote the safety aspect by putting some context behind the damage that we see. Of course, my heart still goes out to those that were impacted by the Rolling Fork event. There are links in description below in order for you to help the Rolling Fork victims. I made sure that these links are from reputable people that are directly helping the residents of Rolling Fork. So like I said, thank you so much for watching and I hope you stay safe out there and we'll catch you in the next one.